Um, ladies and gentlemen, hello. Extremely short notice. Welcome to the Ecology, Cosmos and Consciousness Salon. Um, it's kind of semi-regular, elastic, stochastic, fantastic uh, <laughs> gathering, usually uh, last Tuesday of the month, but that kind of does vary as well, depending who's in town when. I've been running for about seven years. Uh, we also kind of zoop off in little interesting tangents and organize other associated events, co-organize uh, an event called Breaking Convention. My friend Dave and Adam, who are also here, you may have heard of that. It's a psychedelic conference, happens every two years, uh, recently at the University of Greenwich. We have a couple of books associated with that, which you can find available at the back if you're interested. Essays on psychedelic research. Um, some of the other things to do, just like to say a little bit about where we are, the fantastic October Gallery, which is part of the uh, Synergia movement, associated with that is Synergetic Press. One of the wonderful things they do is publish a whole range of fantastic psychedelic books. I'd like to draw your attention to this fantastic book called uh, Mystic Chemist about uh, Albert Hoffman and another one called Zigzag Zen, which they've just produced, is just coming out, uh, if you are interested. There are discount vouchers for you. You can get a 30% off those books. This is the last of the plugs. And they're also bringing out uh, a re-edition of what's called the Ayahuasca Reader, uh, which is one of the first kind of seminal books on ayahuasca, which has been republished. So loads of great publications and stuff. Uh, I haven't got the lineup for the rest of the Ecology, Cosmos and Consciousness series as yet, um, but uh, hopefully I'll, I'll kind of advertise that soon. If you kind of join our Facebook group, Ecology, Cosmos and Consciousness, you can find out about our events. Uh, we have also a sister group in Brighton called Club Imaginal, organised by Adam over there. Show yourself, Adam. <laughs> and uh, they have a talk tomorrow with Graham Hancock, actually, but I shouldn't really tell you that because I think it's sold out anyway. So never mind, so you can't go to that. Um, but maybe we'll get Graham to come and talk here sometime anyway. Meanwhile, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight. He's here from the States, uh, Dr. Dennis McKenna, is an ethnopharmacologist, uh, botanist, um, and a psychedelic researcher who spent his entire life uh, researching uh, on, on ayahuasca. I think he occasionally does some research when he isn't on ayahuasca as well. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> is that right, Dennis? We'll find that's out. It, that's it, that's it, pretty much. Uh, and famously, actually, Dennis, once upon a time, uh, part of the October Gallery here is a kind of network of uh, kind of great nodes, and one of them is a Heraclitus ship. There's a, a Chinese junk ship has been sailing around the world almost continuously since the 1970s when it was built. And Dennis and his brother Terence uh, once sailed on that, uh, down the Amazon, I believe, um, back in 1981. He maybe may or may not mention that. But anyway, enough of that. So please join me in welcoming Terence, uh, Dennis McKenna. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Wow, well, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, this, uh, this is quite a turnout. Uh, I'm, I'm delighted and uh, delighted to be in the UK for my first time. I've been meeting, meeting so many marvelous people and seeing part of, a uh, small part, unfortunately, of your country because I've been uh, pretty much my, on, they've had me on a short leash since I've been here. I think this is the fourth or fifth seminar or event that we've done. So I'm kind of losing track and uh, I'm losing energy too. I, I was at the Plant Consciousness Conference over the weekend. Uh, how many people were there? Okay, so, um, what did you think? Good, huh? Yeah, I, I thought it was a marvelous event. Um, apologies to some of you who were there, though, because some of what I'm going to talk about today uh, was in the, in the talk I gave at Plant Consciousness, but they didn't give me enough time, and so I kind of rushed through it. But you'll, you're going to see some of the same slides, but in a different context. So, you know, I, I shamelessly ripped off my own material uh, to generate this, this new talk. And, uh, yeah, so uh, anyway, um, 
that's, and I'm going to talk about, you know, as you see, waking up the monkeys, plant teachers, and the rediscovery of nature. And uh, <clears throat> I want to mention uh, the Hefter Research Institute, uh, which I'm a founding board member and an affiliate of. We were founded in 1992. Uh, and basically, it was, it's a nonprofit organization that is uh, investigating biomedical and medical applications for psychedelics. And when we, when we started, uh, it was quite aspirational uh, that we would ever get to this place. And now we're at this place. We, the Hefter, and the whole psychedelic community of interest. I don't know if we ever thought we'd reach the point where psychedelics are about to find their proper place again in medicine. Of course, in indigenous cultures, they've always been at the center of ethnomedicine, of traditional healing. But now, now uh, modern biomedicine is rediscovering these things a bit nervously, uh, but it's going to transform medicine and psychiatry and, and medical practice uh, to see these substances reintegrated into, into healing, which is where they belong, and then from there it's going to uh, transform society, and Lord knows we need that. So, uh, so if you don't know any of the Hefter's work, um, I urge you to look at hefter.org, um, where it summarizes uh, some of the research projects that we have going on. Um, most of it wasn't really planned this way, but most of the leading researchers uh, in psychedelics, particularly in psilocybin, and we've kind of staked out psilocybin as our drug of choice, if you will, uh, make no claims to it, but it just fits very well into clinical studies. So we have a lot of different things going on with psilocybin. Uh, NYU, uh, Johns Hopkins, UCLA, different, you know, fairly high-level universities and some of the best uh, researchers on the cutting edge of, of all this research. So, you know, uh, Hefter is now, um, you know, we're, we're getting funding and we're going forward. And we're sort of a, you know, the bastard stepchild in some way of MAPS, which most of you have heard of, Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, uh, headed by Rick Doblin. And they've kind of focused on MDMA, uh, particularly for the treatment of PTSD and other types of trauma-related uh, situations. And psilocybin is not the same, obviously, as MDMA. It's more of a true psychedelic, and, uh, but it also has many applications, maybe broader applications. So look at the website and learn what's going on there. Um, David, am I going to have to hurry through this, or can I actually bore people with lots of details? What's our time frame here? Okay, well, um, so um, the brain uh, is actually the most complex structure that we've so far identified in the known universe. and. Uh, it's extremely complicated, uh, little uh, five pounds or three pounds or whatever of jelly, but there's a lot going on in there. And as you know, the brain is packed with neurons and neurons talk to each other through synapses. Synapses are the junctions between nerve cells between which the neurotransmitters are released from one and cross that gap, that synaptic junction, and, and bind to receptors on, on the other side. So in the brain, these neurotransmitters are sort of the messenger molecules of the brain. And in biology, the term, the formal term is signal transduction. But essentially, they're, they're sending messages back to each other. They're, they're talking to each other. And in the brain, there's estimated between 100 and 500 trillion synapses in the brain. It contains more connections than all of the computers and routers on the internet. And if we compare that to another complex structure like the Milky Way galaxy, the Milky Way is estimated to contain only about 100 billion stars 
And if each synapse in our brain is equated to a star, then our brain is the equivalent of a thousand galaxies. So there's a lot of complexity packed into a very small space. And this is one of the uh, sort of aspects of biology, that complexity, uh, really in all natural systems, but, but complexity leads to emergent properties uh, that the, the components by themselves don't have. Uh, and so in, in the case of the brain, it's, it's consciousness. Somehow you get that much complexity packed into that small space and that much signal transduction action going on, suddenly uh, the lights come on and uh, you, know, you have consciousness. So, uh, and consciousness or the human brain, I wanna talk a little bit about human uh, neural evolution. Um, as we know, the, uh, the brain of uh, contemporary Homo sapiens is a lot bigger, not necessarily uh, better or smarter, as we're finding out, than, than our uh, hominid progenitors. But uh, this uh, process of neural evolution, this explosion literally in the, in the size of the human brain took place over a ridiculously short span of evolutionary time. Uh, only about two million years. Within two million years, the size of the human brain increased three times. Our earlier progenitors uh, around on, on this scale here, you see uh, millions of years on this scale and uh, the centimeters, uh, cubic centimeters of, of uh, brain size on the bottom scale. So back in the earlier days, uh, probably Homo habilis, about one to two million years ago, um, right here, was the first probably true hominid. And, uh, oops, <laughs> didn't mean that to happen. I wanna get back to this for a minute. I'm not done talking about this. Okay, um, Homo habilis, and then followed later by Homo erectus, and finally modern Homo sapiens, who came on the scene pretty late uh, maybe about 100,000 years ago or 200,000 years ago. Uh, so there's been this extremely rapid uh, increase in complexity of the, of the human brain and also in, in a neural size or uh, cranial size. So uh, what might have given rise to that? Why did that happen? What, what triggered this rapid? Uh, increase in, in brain size and, and, uh, and uh, in, you know, complexity and presumably intelligence, although sometimes I'm not so sure. But anyway, um, so this is kind of the picture, and I should say, you know, this is changing all the time, right? This, the, the, the picture is very incomplete. There are always new discoveries happening. So this is an old slide, and I was, was probably out of date the, the day I put it here. But in general, this is, this is the picture of neural evolution. And so we have the brain. And the brain is, uh, you know, our brain is just uh, sets us apart from nature in terms of its complexity. And it leads to, uh, it makes us an anomaly. Uh, from all the species in nature. Uh, because of the brain, we have a complex language. Uh, other animals have language, but nothing like our complex language. No animal has done the, uh, the sonnets of Shakespeare or you know, these sorts of things. Um, we're the only technology utilizing species. Uh, and inventing species. And our technology is complex. It goes far beyond you know, digging sticks to get termites out of a hill. I mean, we build computers and spaceships and, and all of this stuff. So we're a technology utilizing species, partly because, in fact, in large part, because we have these hands, these opposable thumbs, and they're restless, and they like to muck about and invent things. Uh, importantly, we're the only species that stores information outside of ourselves, information that's not genetic. We can store it in the form of writing and oral traditions and artistic expression and all this. And this gives us a way to encode information and transmit it down 
generations and across a space to other cultures, to other parts of the world. So that's another sort of an anomaly that, um, that Homo sapiens uh, exhibit. We have figured out a way to encode information non-genetically and transmit it. That's because we have language and a great deal of, uh, uh, you know, neural real estate, if you want to say, large parts of the brain are devoted to the generation of language and or the comprehension of language. So, so clearly uh, a lot of the expansion of the human brain had to do with the rapid evolution of this, uh, these linguistic capabilities. And as a result of that, we live in an ocean of ideas. For us, ideas and abstractions are very much as real as the physical world, and sometimes it seems even more real. And this preoccupation with abstraction and the ability to associate meaning with symbols is the foundation of human culture. And as a result of this ability, this ability to create abstractions and understand them, we've created culture. And culture is a complex entity. Obviously, it's an, it's an edifice in a way. It's a technology in a way but it includes everything that we associate with culture, art and science and you know, religion, magic, myth, uh, medicine, technology, folklore, law. If it weren't for culture and if it weren't for language, we would not have those things. And this clearly sets us, us apart from other biological species who may have simpler cultures, but nothing like uh, human culture. And this is all because we have this extraordinarily complex brain and it's hard to say, you know, put cart before horse or chicken before egg. Did we have this complex brain before these things happen? Or was the invention and, and the, you know, evolution into this linguistic capability what stimulated uh, the, uh, the evolu this evolution and complexity in, in the human brain? Well, as a result of this process, starting about three million years ago and coming up to today, uh, we, have, uh, we have us, who I sometimes like to call the problematic primate. Uh, easily the most dangerous uh, evolutionary innovation that nature's ever come up with, and also the most promising innovation that it's ever come up with. So it's sort of like, you know, the analogy in, in our culture might be something like uh, nuclear energy or something. You know, extremely useful, you can do good things with it, but very dangerous. And we're sort of like that in our relationship to nature. Uh, and, and, you know, nature's taken a gamble. Why it's done so is a matter we might get into. But, um, you know, so we've got this hypertrophy brain, for some reason, this extremely expanded brain in complexity. That gives us complex language, it gives us symbolic thinking, it gives us creative, artistic abilities. It also makes us quite aggressive and warlike, in case you haven't noticed. We're a very creative species when, it's, when it comes to killing each other. Seem, that seems to be a focus of a lot of our inventiveness. Um, we're technological, as I mentioned, we make stuff, we invent things and use them. We also have a religious and spiritual aspect. Not clear if animals have a spiritual life, but we certainly do. Uh, and, you know, that's born out of the perception that there is a transcendent world, there is an unseen world that transcends our own from which we gain knowledge. And uh, we are an extremely clever species as a result of this. The problem is, in this particular historical juncture, we're not very wise, and we're beginning to realize that we're not very wise, and I think that the, you know, the, the, the task is to bring our cleverness and our wisdom into sync with each other so that we, we do control these these technologies that could be enormously destructive, and in fact they are, we're seeing the consequences of this on a global scale with uh, environmental destruction. This is because we make bad choices. 
about how to deploy this technology, how to relate to it. You know, we have a certain, humans have a certain arrogance. It's like, well, we'll do it, you know, because we can do it. And it's like, you know, this is maybe not the best way to proceed. We need wisdom to guide our choices, since, especially since we <clears throat> control these uh, very powerful and potentially quite, de quite beneficial, but also quite potentially destructive technologies. So we need to, uh, we need to try to overcome that, that disjunct. Um, okay, so that's the picture of uh, neural evolution and, and the current state of the problematic primate. So let's back up a minute, let's talk about plants for a while. And uh, one thing that plants do that we don't do, and that actually most organisms on the planet don't do, is they've mastered this process of photosynthesis, which is a really neat trick. Uh, they have figured <coughs> out how to take sunlight, carbon dioxide, and water, and use those very simple reactants, use the energy of the sun to drive the reaction, to convert these inorganic compounds into simple organic compounds and sugars, simple carbohydrates, are the initial products of photosynthesis. And I'll get into this in excruciatingly boring detail in a minute, but uh, just appreciate that for a minute. As a result of this, plants are virtuoso chemists. They don't have to worry about energy. They have all the energy they need from the sun. In chemistry, you worry, do we have enough energy to drive the reactions? They got energy to burn, literally. And as a result, they make an enormous variety of organic molecules from these simple precursors, sun, using sunlight, water, and carbon dioxide. Uh, and so there's an, an incredible molecular diversity in the biosphere uh, as a result of these, this photosynthetic process. And this is just, again, if you've taken plant physiology, this is a quick review in a sense. You know, photosynthesis, uh, sunlight is harvested by the chlorophyll pigments in, in the leaf, and it's used to drive this reaction, producing carbohydrates and oxygen. Of course, this is the basis of the food chain. Uh, everything on the planet that is not photosynthetic, that it does not make its own food, is essentially uh, a parasite on plants. And plants freely give of their products, but we are a parasite on plants. If the animals went away tomorrow, the plants would, would do just fine. And of course, the joke here, you already get it, I see. Plants don't get fat because they're light eaters, right? Okay. Um. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, so here's a more complex diagram of photosynthesis. And uh, I don't have my, uh, my pointer, but, uh, but up in the left there, you have your sunlight, carbon dioxide, and water. And uh, in photosynthesis, uh, plants use the energy of the sun to essentially ionize water. And that's a tough thing to do, but they figured out to, how to do it at a low temperature. And from that process of ionization, they get protons, they get hydrogens. A uh, byproduct of this reaction, fortunately for us, happens to be oxygen. And uh, you know we all need oxygen, right? Most breathing things do. And so f the plants have given us oxygen. Uh, in the evolution of the biosphere, oxygen was the first pollutant. There was a whole anaerobic uh, biosphere before oxygen became the major pollutant of the atmosphere, and those organisms were either driven extinct or driven into deeper and deeper into the earth. The, the, a, the uh, anaerobic biosphere was mostly microbial. And it was interesting enough, but kind of by our standards, it was kind of boring. You know, there wasn't this diversity of, of forms and so on. But in the, uh, so as I mentioned, the, the initial uh, reactions, maybe, uh, maybe I should just, the initial um, reactions of photosynthesis lead to sugars. 
simple carbohydrates. And then from that, it branches off into many, many different pathways and leads to what are essentially the, the molecules of life, you know, nucleic acids, lipids, amino acids, proteins, uh, that kind of thing. What is called, sometimes in plant biochemistry, called uh, primary products or the, the primary products of photosynthesis. And these are kind of universal in all organisms. They're essentially the molecules of life. They're what we need for life to run on. But then plants, because they have this synthetic ability, they don't stop there. They produce a lot of other uh, compounds called secondary compounds, and these are in the yellow boxes here. Now, these are not universally distributed in all living things. We know this. They're only found, so we know they're not essential for life. So why do plants bother making this? And those are things like, you know, the alkaloids, the nitrogen-containing secondary compounds, the phenolic compounds, things like lignans and tannins and flavonoids, the things that give uh, leaves their color in the fall. Uh, your terpenoids, which are the source of, you know, your uh, aromatic uh, small molecular weight terpenes, that, which are the source of plants' fragrances and that sort of thing, and higher molecular weight terpenes like the diterpenes, of which taxol is a good example, the, the compound from you that's very important, uh, anti-cancer plant for us, the, the plant steroids, all of these things are secondary compounds, so-called, I mean, and it's not a, it's kind of an older term, it's not really a pejorative term, they just, well, not everything makes these. Only certain plants make secondary compounds, and usually plant families, or sometimes genera, are characterized by particular classes of secondary compounds. For example, you know, a good example of, say, the Apocynaceae family, or the Rubiaceae family, the coffee family. You know, very well, you think of that as an alkaloidal family. Lots and lots of alkaloids in that family. And these secondary compounds are often valuable to us as medicines, as fragrances, as dyes, as, as food, of course, all of those things. These secondary compounds we have discovered and we put them to use. Uh, and, and I guess I should also mention, because this is important, that in, in this process of photosynthesis, of course, one of the, the chief reactants of photosynthesis is carbon dioxide. And what, what goes on in photosynthesis is that the plants use those proteins, that they, or uh, protons, those hydrogens, that they get from uh, ionizing water, and they use those to reduce carbon. Carbon dioxide is attached to a molecule uh, that is essentially a receptor molecule, and then it's reduced. So this is what maintains the balance of carbon dioxide in the biosphere. Uh, and it has maintained it within parameters tolerable to life for, oh, what's this? I've got a nice laser pointer. A pointer, okay, fantastic. Well, that was the one I needed the pointer for, but <laughs> thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so that's really important because that's one of the, you know, the, the Earth's biosphere is maintained within these parameters that life can tolerate and has been for 3.8 billion years within broad, broad parameters because we know life has existed. So the temperature of the earth uh, as a whole has never gone above the boiling point of water, never gone below the freezing point of water, although it has in great areas. But overall, it's been a pretty you know, uh, well-regulated system and it's all regulated by feedback loops of all so sorts in the biosphere. And one of the big ones is the carbon cycle and where CO2 is captured through photosynthesis and sequestered into the biomass of plants. And so that's why when we devastate thousands of square miles of Amazon rainforest and other environments, not only do we don't not have those plants to act as carbon sinks, but usually we turn around and burn all those things, all those trees that we tear down and, and release that carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. So here's a statistic. They figure that uh, 
about 30% of global warming, about 30% of greenhouse gas emissions are the result of tropical forest deforestation. Uh, so that's a big number. And it also tells us that we can think about all sorts of ways to reduce emission of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere or greenhouse gases. But uh, you know, one very simple way, which we could do tomorrow, is just put the fires out. Just stop cutting down and burning these rainforests because they're maintaining the, the conditions on the planet that make life possible. And not incidentally, well, somewhat incidentally, but also in the process, there we're sacrificing all of this biochemical diversity that plants make, most of which is uninvestigated as far as useful medicines, for example. So the rainforests are the pharmacies of the future, and we're burning down the pharmacies. There's no way to tell what the value of these undiscovered medicines that were destroyed, because they never will be discovered. How do you put a price on a cure for AIDS that grew in a forest that you burned down last week? So we're we're uh, we're uh, you know we're definitely depleting and and uh, depleting these resources. So all these secondary compounds that plants make, what, why do they make them? Do they make them so that we can adopt them and make useful things out of them? Well, in part, possibly. Uh, maybe they make them out of uh, out of sheer exuberance, you know, because they can. But no, there's more to the story. A famous botanist, um, a British botanist, of course, um, Tony Swain once said, plants substitute biosynthesis for behavior. The language of plants is chemistry. The behavior of plants with all organisms in the environment that it has to live in is mediated largely uh, through chemistry. So these secondary metabolites, as shown in the previous slide, are actually messenger molecules. Interesting, huh? Because they're signal transduction molecules that work on the ecosystem level. Much like neurotransmitters work in the brain, these things work uh, you know, on a global level as messenger molecules. Well, what do they do? They mediate the relationship between plants and other organisms in the environment, everything, other plants. They use them to talk to other plants. They use them to communicate with fungi and microorganisms in the soil, which form close symbiotic relationships with plants through the rhizosphere, through the network of roots that they have. They use them to interact with insects and form, initiate and form symbioses with insects. And because, as you know, with many plants, the flowering plants, uh, insects are very important to their pollination processes. So, you know, again, a reminder of how different plants are from us. You know, I mean, if we had to have another species assist in our reproductive cycle, we'd think that was kind of kinky. But in the case of plants, this is how they do it. They need that insect to assist through pollination with their completing their, their sexual uh, reproduction. They interact with herbivores, herbivores of which we are one type of herbivore. Herbivores are just things that want to nibble on plants. They want to uh, you know, consume plants. And humans, we are herbivores too. Most herbivores that are not human probably consume plants for nutrition. They, are, they want to eat, eat them because they provide nutrition. Uh, and we do that too. Um, but we also consume plants for lots of other reasons too. And that's partly a function of this hypertrophy brain that we do. Our relationship with these secondary compounds is complex. We get, for example, drugs out of them all kinds of drugs, all kinds of medicines, psychoactive drugs of different types, which we consume largely because we like them. We are enjoying them. Even though the plant may have originally evolved those compounds as a signal to say, maybe stay away. In other words, uh, many of these secondary compounds are defensive compounds and they're repellents. They're, uh, a signal to think, don't eat me, stay away. I don't taste good and I'm poisoned and I'll kill you. You know, that's one of the messages. Um, 
which we in some very often we uh, undermine that message. Uh, we might take the, the bitterness of an alkaloid, for example, which is uh, kind of a, a sensory signal that this is uh, something to be avoided. But we, through experimentation and our curiosity, we might react to that bitterness and say, oh, it's bitter, contains an alkaloid. Hmm, wonder if you can smoke this stuff, you know, or something like that. Because we know enough through evolution that often consuming these compounds, which has very often have effects on the nervous system, can lead to interesting results. So plants use uh, these secondary compounds, it's essentially their language, their signal transduction system. Through that, they orchestrate the whole system of biofeedback loops that regulate the biosphere. And they use them for defense. More interestingly, they use them for semiosis, which is, again, signaling, a signaling function. They send out a signal, most, and a signal can be something simple, like stay away, or it can be something like, well, come closer. The, the semiotic message can be, let's form an association. Let's symbiose, if you will. So symbiosis is a close association, and usually a cooperative association, between different species. And, you know, in like classical evolutionary theory, neo-Darwinism or whatever they have, you know, we think of competition, natural selection, nature's red and tooth and claw and all that stuff. Not so much, you know, the, the picture that's, that's emerging now is that nature's actually a pretty cooperative place. It's based on collaboration and symbiosis. It's sort of like working together, we can do more. So the plants initiate that pact with, uh, you know, with, other, with fungi and, and uh, microorganisms in the environment and also with us uh, in a certain way. You know, it's, it's though we will, we the plants will provide you with useful things foods or medicines or other useful things, and in turn, we, you get to domesticate us, or you get to think you're domesticating us. Actually, you, they're domesticating us. You know, we're not domesticating the plants, but whatever. It gives plants a certain protection from the vicissitudes of natural selection, so they get a kind of a, a free ride in a certain way. They, uh, they are protected under our wing. Um, until we, you know, f so as long as we don't completely wreck the planet, they've got it pretty good, these domesticated plants. Of course, you know, we're working very hard to wreck the planet, so I don't know how long the free ride's going to last. But that's the situation uh, that we have here. So this is just a diagram that shows some of the effects of these secondary compounds in the diet. Secondary compounds in plants lead to naturally occurring toxins and human dietary exposure. And out of that, a number of things follow. On the phenotypic level, our interaction leads to behaviors like recognition and avoidance behaviors, or different repulsion mechanisms, or ways to rid ourselves of these toxins when we're exposed to it, like vomiting and diarrhea. You know, if you've had Ayahuasca, that's a classic example, and that's a situation where, you know, vomiting is uh, actually a pretty good thing. It's a, prote it's a protective mechanism. Uh, and we have different behavioral detoxification techniques because we want to be omnivores. We want to eat a wide variety of plants. So we have to, uh, you know, find a way to deal with these, these more or less toxic plants so we can consume them. So we've developed very sophisticated detoxification mechanisms, well, things like cooking. I mean, that's pretty obvious, but when cooking came along, that was, that was a big deal. You know? And if you look at indigenous cultures now using something like manioc, which is essentially a toxic plant, very elaborate ways of removing those toxins so that it is now globally probably one of the most important starchy staples uh, that, are, uh, that people rely on. There are also physiological detoxification mechanisms that are activated through our uh, GI system and endocrine metabolism. In other words, inbuilt 
detoxification mechanisms that exposure to these chemicals will activate. A lot of these enzymes are so-called inducible enzymes. So uh, on the genotype <coughs> side, we have that. Uh, we have this. We, this dietary exposure feeds back on the genome and leads to alterations in DNA structures and gene expression and this sort of thing. Also, this induction of specific gene products, uh, hormones and so on. These are the process of, uh, it goes on at the individual level. This is partly why everybody is a biochemically unique, a biochemical unique individual, depending on the chemical ecology that they live in. So the, the enzyme profiles of your liver is not the same as my liver, or not the same as that gentleman's liver out there. We're all unique because we all have a, an individual diet, an individual exposure to these compounds. Well, on the population level and through time, this leads to a number of consequences. Initiated variations in diverse metabolic processes, such as modifications in disease susceptibility, which can lead to advantages. Um, you know, a, a trivial, simple example is if you've got one population that's consuming a plant that contains a strong immune stimulant, that population is likely to be more resistant to disease than the population in the valley one, you know, the valley next door, which maybe does not have that plant. So that population, you know, has a differential survival capability. Changes in individual and group biological fitness, essentially an adaptation to this chemical ecology. I want you to think about the fact that we're immersed in this incredible soup of plant secondary compounds, uh, you know, uh, so, and ultimately this leads to shifts in gene frequencies based on these differential survival and reproduction dynamics. This has evolutionary con consequences. This is in part what drives uh, our evolution forward. And uh, yeah. Um, Okay, so you got that system, the whole chemical ecology, the, in, the uh, in biological environment, if you will, in which these primates, us, evolved and everything else, leading to this hypertrophy brain, which came about somehow uh, in a short period of time. So backing up on that, Brains, messenger molecules, just like plants, are the neurotransmitters. And as I mentioned, the neurotransmitters are what signal transduction molecules that mediate crosstalk between neurons. And all of the brain's critical functions, including our experience of consciousness, are mediated by this neuronal crosstalk, these, this synaptic crosstalk mediated by chemicals. Interestingly enough, the main neurotransmitters that we know from neurophysiology uh, mediate consciousness are serotonin and norepinephrine and dopamine. Those come from aromatic amino acids, which we do not make. We have to get those from our diet. So the molecules running around in the brain that are generating consciousness are actually plant products. You know, we're partly plants, or at least we get those from, from the diet. So that's interesting. Um, yeah. Um, okay, so that all, of course, these external messenger molecules that happen to be neuroactive or act on the central nervous system, psychoactive drugs, in other words, they work mostly by affecting some aspect of neurotransmission. They either affect the storage or the, or the synthesis or the release or the degradation or the reuptake of neurotransmitters, or most often perhaps, and, and very often, they, they act by mimicking the neurotransmitter at the synaptic receptors, either blocking its effect or acting something like the neurotransmitter does, but different because it's structurally different. And that's where you get the variation in experience uh, that psychoactive drugs elicit. I like Salvador Dali's uh, quote because it really brings home and reminds us that 
you know, it's not about taking drugs. We're made of drugs. It's important to remember that because we're biochemical engines that run on drugs. Uh, whether they come from outside or inside is uh, hardly matters. Neurotransmitters are drugs, hormones are drugs, and they make us up. They're part of this biochemical complexity. Um, so the uh, Partnership for the Drug-Free America, or whatever the organization is, I'm sorry to have to tell you, but you're not, it's not gonna work because we're made of drugs. And these neurotransmitters and these plant messenger molecules evolved from the same evolutionary precursors. The same signal transduction molecules in our brain work on the ecological level, mediating communications between organisms. So we really, it's not so strange that plants contain all these neurotransmitter-like molecules that act on brain receptors. And when it comes to psychedelics, I'm sure I'm talking to a very well-informed crowd on, on this subject, we know that serotonin, uh, one of these neurotransmitters, uh, also called 5-hydroxytryptamine or 5-HT, is kind of one of the master neurotransmitters of the brain. It's phylogenetically one of the oldest neurotransmitters. As you can see, it's a very simple compound, uh, just a couple steps away from its amino acid precursor, which is tryptophan, uh, which is everywhere. It's one of the 20 that go into proteins. Uh, and we know from neurophysiology, neuroscientists, neuroscience studies that Serotonin regulates processes like sleep and dreams, attention, perception obviously, mood, sexual behavior, eating behavior, and so on. So it's, it's very important for a lot of, a lot of different, different processes. And serotonin receptors as shown here, serotonin neurons sort of originate in the brainstem and then these uh, arborize throughout the brain, especially the modern part of the brain, the neocortex, as well as the, the uh, amygdala and uh, hippocampus and other, other parts of the brain. And uh, very important in so many different functions. And uh, in the brain and all through the body, there are serotonin receptors. There are actually more serotonin uh, in the gut and more serotonin receptors in the gut than in the brain. But overall, uh, there's about 14 different subtypes of serotonin receptors that have been identified in the brain. That's uh, quite a few. And um, the psychedelics, the classical psychedelics, like LSD and psilocybin and DMT, interact selectively with one particular of these subtypes, the so-called 5-HT2A receptors. And I sometimes make a distinction and say, I, I like to call these the true psychedelics. And people object to that because they say, well, what about salvia? What about you know, other types of things that don't, that they definitely cause profound alterations in consciousness? But I say they're not true psychedelics because they don't have that 5-HT2A interaction. So it's an arbitrary definition, but it's a way of kind of, uh, you know, uh, defining these uh, as a special group. And the classical, you know, the most uh, widespread and the, and the sort of prototype or archetypal uh, of the psychedelics are the simple tryptamine derivatives, of which DMT is is the the precursor to many others. It's an extremely simple molecule and it's quite widespread in nature. It, we know of about 150 species of plants in which DMT has been identified, but in fact, the real number is much greater than that. It's been identified in 150 species because people have looked for it, but knowing how simple it is and how easy it is to convert tryptophan to DMT, to tryptamine, to DMT, it's reasonable to suppose that it's found in thousands and thousands and thousands of species. In fact, it's not an exaggeration to say that nature is drenched in DMT. It's a very common compound. And in fact, my theory 
uh, is that it's found in all plants and, and small amounts, right? If you had sufficiently sensitive instrumentation, you could go out and start grabbing plants out of the garden and running them through your mass spec and you'd pick up DMT literally in every plant because it's so simple. So it really is true. It's just everywhere. It's ubiquitous in nature. And these psychedelics, DMT and psilocybin, which is a close uh, derivative of uh, DMT and these other things, uh, these target the neurotransmitters, the serotonin transmitters that mediate consciousness in, this, in the brains of these uh, problematic primates. Um, so if these things are messenger molecules, uh, you know, trying to send us a message from the ecosphere, what is the message? Actually, there are a number of messages, but the primary one, I think, <laughs> is symbiosis. These plants want to form symbioses with the problematic primates. This is the message. Form a relationship with us and we'll teach you things, and indeed they do. So for the plants to form a symbiosis, as I mentioned, is kind of to create an evolutionary free ride. We'll protect them from natural selection. Of course, we'll, you know, they have to, it's kind of a pact with the devil because then we'll, we'll subject them to artificial selection which was you know, innocent enough when artificial selection amounted to selective breeding and, and this sort of thing, but now we actually reach into the genome of plants and muck around and make changes. This is another example where you know, our, our, uh, our cleverness has maybe outpaced our wisdom. We need to use this power, because we have it, very, very carefully and with consciousness. Um, and there are other important messages that the plants are sponsors and sponsors of everything on earth, by the way. A number of messages, wake up, you monkeys. That's a big one. Wake up because you're wrecking this place and uh, we're not happy about this. So, you know, that's a big message. And another one, you monkeys only think you're running the show, and that's something you need to get over. You're not running the show. We do not own nature. We only think we own nature. Nature owns us. And really, the plants are running the show. The plants are what's maintaining this whole system in homeostatic balance. So we should remember that we're not running the show and that we can have enormously uh, damaging effects on the, on the whole system as we destabilize these homeostatic cycles, the, you know, you can think of Gaia, you can think of the whole planet as a cell, in a sense, and the same processes that go on in the cell, that keep it running smoothly, very much go on on the planetary level as well. Very, very similar processes. Another message, which we tend to forget, is never forget how little you monkeys know. And I would, uh, you know, especially if you're a scientist, you know, it's very easy for science to be quite arrogant and we can be very proud of and boast of our knowledge and how much we found out and so on. And we have found out quite a lot about the world and the way it works. We should never forget that there's an infinitely larger amount of stuff that we don't know. So there's no place for arrogance here. There's a place for humility. There's a place for um, uh, marveling at how complex and wonderful the world is and how little we understand. So humility is something that we all need more of and especially, you know, our sort of demonic science. You know, we need to uh, raise consciousness on that level. And I would even put a fourth uh, one in here, which I didn't put on the slide, but I would say another caution that the plants send us is don't forget that you are monkeys. Um, okay, so some of you are old enough to remember this iconic image. Maybe some of, some of you are not. How many of you have seen 2001, uh, Stanley Kubrick's film, right? Enough to know. Well, um, possibly the greatest science fiction film ever made, I have to say. Uh, but this is the monolith, 
And I put it in here because it symbolizes something uh, that I think is important. In, in the science fiction film, the monolith appears out of nowhere one day on the Serengeti plain, you know, and the primates are there and they're beating each other up and fighting and doing all this stuff and fucking and whatever primates do, right? All of a sudden, you know, my God, this huge monolithic black thing shows up and, uh, you know, and it, uh, they don't know what to make of it. It, it uh, you know, it's terrifying and it's incomprehensible. It's obviously completely alien. And, uh, you know, they, they look up from whatever they're doing for a moment. And, and it is a symbol for what Rudolf Otto, the philosopher, once called the Mysterium Tremendum. It's a tremendous mystery, something that cannot be comprehended, is completely terrifying, and you can't take your eyes away from it. So it's fascinating, right? And in the, in the science fiction film, the monolith, is stands in for, um, it shows up at critical junctures in human history. And it, it shows up, well, the next time they encounter it in the movie is 50,000 years later when we have achieved a near Earth, uh, you know, we've at least reached the moon and we have we're beginning to develop a near Earth space exploration capability. And what do you know? It shows up in a crater on the moon. You know, and it shows up, and then it shows up, but you know, they go after it, they go to Jupiter. You all know the story. The point is that it, it shows up at critical uh, evolutionary junctures in human history, and it kind of nudges us along toward this imagined future. One of the things that the problematic primates do that I don't think other animals do is they anticipate the future. They think about the future. In some ways, they imagine the future, and thereby they construct it. The monolith is a stimulus to this cognitive and neural evolution that goes on in the story. But you don't have to go to Jupiter to find the equivalent of the monolith. The monolith has existed in nature long before we did. I mean, you look at the phylogeny of fungi, it's clear that these psychoactive fungi were here hundreds of millions of years before anything like a mammalian nervous system showed up. But there they are in nature, and they're easy to find. I mean, they're pretty obvious if you go into a field where these Psilocybe cubensis type mushrooms grow. They're brightly colored, they're big, and you're a foraging primate, and you're hungry most of the time, and these look pretty good. And so naturally, they're going to be consumed, either deliberately or, or, or accidentally. But probably deliberately, initially, without really knowing what, what uh, you're getting into. And once that uh, connection is made, you have the revelation that comes from that, the existence of this whole other world of awareness, this unseen world. This is the trigger for neural evolution, for cognitive evolution, and I maintained you know, in my other talk, and I, I do maintain that this was the trigger that introduced the world of abstractions and ideas and, and created the critical association between symbols and meaning, whether seen or heard. This was what did us. Th these are the plant teachers and probably, and we have many now, but what's unique about the mushrooms in, is they require no technology, they require no invention to be effective. We know there's a complex, uh, you know, ethno, medical technology, if you will, around the preparation of uh, things like ayahuasca. Ayahuasca is a very sophisticated pharmaceutical preparation. It takes a lot of cleverness to, to make that one and prepare it and so on. Mushrooms, not so much. You don't have to have technology. You have to, you know, bend down and pick it up and eat it. And that's about all you have to do and, you know, the connection is made. So. I maintain that these were probably the first psychedelics. Uh, and Psilocybe cubensis is in the tropics, pan-global. Uh, it's everywhere in the tropics, and there are similar species in temperate areas that are also global. So it's everywhere in nature. It's a matter of noticing them and, and realizing that they are here. 
after that discovery was made, at a certain period in history, you know, maybe, well, it's, it's hard to put dates on these things, but some, sometime but, you know, after 20,000 years, based on the, on the archaeological evidence, which is sparse, uh, you know, and it may go be much, uh, much more ancient than that, uh, but psychedelics suddenly appeared, suddenly, maybe in 10,000 years span time, well, things moved slower back in those days, but, you know, they occur, they appear everywhere in every part of the, wor of the world. We've got the Nasali, uh, Najir Plateau, clearly all this mushroom iconography, the sometimes called the bee shaman, but clearly the mushroom shaman with all of these mushrooms growing out of his or her body and, and holding clusters of mushrooms. You would get these peyote shows up, probably the earliest um, um, archaeological uh, discovery of peyote is in the lower Pecos River. So these are, you know, 6,000 years ago. These are the miniature mushroom stones from Guatemala go back as far as 3000 BCs. Uh, this, these mushroom iconogra mushroom icons or these mushroom silhouettes show up here in this uh, Spain, in a uh, cave in Spain, the Selva Pascuala cave 6,000 years ago in Chavin, the Chavin culture in Peru. Uh, not so old, but this, you know, but clearly they were aware this is the San Pedro cactus. The snuffs, the uh, Sibyl snuffs are from a leguminous tree, Anadenanthera, uh, which makes uh, seeds that are very flat and about the size of a quarter. And uh, they are very, very high in dimethyltryptamine and they can be prepared as a snuff. <coughs> and in the new world, um, the snuffs are actually the most ancient uh, of the New World psychedelics, not ayahuasca. Ayahuasca may be fairly recent. We're not sure because the archaeological evidence is much more iffy. But these snuff trays and the, and the snuff tubes that, that uh, go with them are unambiguous. These people were using snuffs. And the Tewanaku culture, for example, uh, by Lake Titicaca, which is about three cultures back from the Inca, that goes back to uh, 2000, 3000 BC, <coughs> based on conventional archaeology. And other estimates are that possibly much, much older. But this culture used snuffs. And so it was a psychedelic culture. It was a DMT using culture way back in the day. Uh, and similarly, there are archaeological remains in northern Peru Corral, uh, which was a megalithic civilization, again, about 5,000 BC, in which these snuff trays have been uh, discovered. <coughs> so, after whatever triggered the, um, our psychedelic experience, our encounter with these probably the mushrooms initially, <clears throat> and then over a relatively short span of time, we discovered all of these plant teachers. And in indigenous cultures, this is sort of how they're understood. They're understood to be intelligent entities that were put on earth to teach us. Uh, and indeed they have through evolutionary and historical time. Uh, we haven't always been listening to their lessons, but they have, uh, you know, they have had that effect. They're a way, uh, they teach us symbiosis, and they teach us a way to be in the world and relate to the other um, members of the community of species. Uh, there's pretty good evidence that there were mystery religions. Uh, the one at, at Eleusis is probably the most recent one, but it's, it's the, it was the last of the psychedelic mystery religions around the Mediterranean that go back to, you know, past the Neo Neolithic. Uh, you probably have heard of the, Go I don't know if I say it right, Gobekli Tepe is a, a megalithic city discovered in in Turkey recently, 
and uh, you know, yeah, there's little uh, argument about how old it was. It was at least 11,600 years old. That's, we thought there were only hunter gatherers around and how could they possibly build the, this complex city? This is uh, one of the mysteries, but they did, and they most likely also used mushrooms. There's plenty of iconographic evidence at Gobekli Tepe that mushrooms were uh, a big part of it. But in historical time, um, mushrooms or possibly ergot, we're not sure, uh, became the basis of these uh, mystery religions, of which the, the cult at Eleusis is, is the most recent one. And direct psychedelic experiences bring about this confrontation with the Mysterium Tremendum, a, a real mystery. And uh, we know that uh, some of the uh, effects of psychedelics are a sense of oceanic boundlessness, is what the neuroscientists call it. That just means we are all one, a sense of our oneness with all of life and really with everything. This is characteristic of psychedelic experiences. So it leads to an apprehension of the unity of all existence. And these effects, these experiences are transformative and, and meaningful for people, even today. You can, through psychedelics, have a mystical experience, and mystical experiences usually have an impact on people. And, you know, but the corollary to that is we have the neural architecture to have mystical experiences, and somehow these messenger molecules target exactly that system. So the mysteries at Eleusis were the last of these psychedelic ecstasy religions, but it really goes back to the Paleolithic. This is a bas-relief from the fifth century that depicts the two goddesses, uh, Demeter and Persephone. These were the two figures of the, uh, of the Eleusinian mysteries, and supposedly they're, according to the interpretation of this, they're exchanging flowers. That looked like a flower to you? <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> so, you know, so these, these mystery religions were, you know, what was happening in Greek culture for the longest time. This was the whole center of religious activity from about 1000 BC to more or less 500 AD. And then the, uh, the tradition was, uh, was uh, uh, decimated, essentially. Um, um, there, the Goths invaded this area around 500 uh, AD. And the mystery religion was already dying out, but that was kind of, the, that marked the end of it because the temple of Demeter at Eleusis was destroyed and the uh, you know, the Aryans came in, or the Goth uh, tribes came in with their much more patriarchal, warlike type of religion. I mean, the, the societies at the time were matriarchal, and they were based on psychedelic ecstasy, and, and that was what was going on, you know. So they were the peace-loving hippies of the time, and the, you know, the warlike uh, invaders from the north uh, came in and broke up the party more or less, and uh, it changed uh, everything in terms of the evolution of uh, Western civilization and Western thought. One of the things that psychedelics bring about, one of the experiences that people commonly have when they have these profound mystical experiences can be characterized several ways, but one of the characteristics is biophilia. They help us love life. Biophilia is the love of living things. And, you know, if you don't think that we have something innate to, uh, you know, about life, we are attracted to living things. I mean, the next time you cuddle a kitten, for example, you know, that's biophilia. Who can resist it, right? I mean, it's kind of that way. So this is an emotional affiliation of human beings to other living organisms, you know, we want that interaction. Uh, or Eric Fromm calls it a psychological attraction to all that is alive and vital. So this is one of the nobler 
uh, feelings that we have. And this, this is triggered by psychedelics, or at least not, uh, you know. Another aspect of uh, the psychedelic experience is animism, which is found in almost all indigenous cultures. It's the idea that uh, all non-human entities, plants, animals, rocks even, uh, or natural phenomena such as weather, uh, they have an inherent spiritual essence. They have, if you will, a kind of intelligence. So in indigenous cultures, these things are seen as external entities, which might be visualized as spirits or, you know, different ways, but they, 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 they attribute intelligence to these things. So there's a recognition that we're not the owners of intelligence in the bios. Everything is intelligent to a certain extent. And along with that goes pantheism. You know, it's a belief that the universe itself or the totality of nature is identical with the divine. There is no external God. If there's a God, God is nature. You know, it, it's not separate from nature. It's part of this. It's eminent in nature. So we have this a sense of the divinity of the natural world of which we're a part. Or at least we were a part until we forgot that. And that's part of our problem. But so these, these characteristics, animism, biophilia, and pantheism are really found in almost all indigenous worldviews, uh, particularly if they use psychedelics. So this indigenous worldview involves mystical experiences directly mediated, a direct experience of a transcendence reality, if you will, biophilia, animism, and pantheism. And uh, in the indigenous experience, informed by the psychedelic experience, these are not belief systems. These are empirical observations of the nature of reality. And interestingly enough, they are, based on what we understand now, they're actually quite scientific understandings of the nature of reality. There's nothing woo-woo about this. As we look closer, as we realize concepts like plant intelligence and intelligence in nature. A few years ago, this would have been laughed out of the classroom. Now, turns out, yep, plants are intelligent. And they exhibit intelligence in numerous ways. They don't have brains, but they do exhibit intelligence and just practically everything does. Viruses, bacteria, you name it. And uh, I could go on about that, but you get the picture. There's a couple of um, articles and things I'd like to mention here. One is, uh, you may know the author uh, Michael Pollan, who wrote uh, The Omnivore's Dilemma and The Botany of Desire, numerous other things, beautiful, interesting books. He wrote a, an article in the, the New Yorker, I believe, a few years ago, maybe a year ago, called The Intelligent Plant. And if you Google that, you pull that article up, I highly recommend it. Very interesting, uh, talking about the state of the science, because now the notion that plants can behave intelligently is kind of being taken back into the fold of scientific investigation, and, and they're finding out plants do remarkable things, and it actually goes beyond just this chemical, chemically mediated interaction. They, they remember, they plan, they form alliances, they plan for the future, they do all kinds of stuff. And uh, <clears throat> another uh, interesting uh, book to read if you, if you want, I, I've been enjoying uh, Stephen Herod Buner's book called uh, Plant Intelligence and the Imaginal Realm. And I highly recommend it. I'm not done with it yet, but I'm reading into it and it's blowing my mind at every page because he kind of combines the sensibilities of a poet and a naturalist with analytical capabilities of, of a good scientist and some of the stuff that he talks about and the complexities of these chemical interactions uh, are just remarkable. You know, for example, I mean, just a trivial example, but interesting, you know, they found that with the tomato plant, if the tomato is infested by a particular species of mite, it will produce uh, protective compounds in response to that attack and it will produce compounds that pull in the predators 
that will get rid of the mites, which is a species of maw, uh, wasp. But it's not just any wasp. The, 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 the tomato plant will actually sample the saliva of the mite and synthesize accordingly an attractant that will bring in exactly the predator that happens to feed on that species of mite. So that's pretty intelligent, uh, you know, and, and this is not uncommon. This is the way they do it. So, uh, so this uh, is going on. Uh, in other, and, and in terms of our own encounter with psychedelics back in the day, we had to invent uh, some technologies of our own to deal with this transcendent world. And out of one of those was shamanism. Shamanism is essentially a technique of traditional practices uh, focused on communication with the spirit world. So it's a, a way to navigate through these non-ordinary realities, a way to come to terms with them and interact with the non-human intelligence those that we find there and obtain knowledge from this realm, useful to the group, to the tribe. Treatment of illness, uh, uses of medicinal plants, the location of games, propitious times to plant or harvest, all of this comes from this transcendent realm of spirits that is totally an experienced reality for indigenous people, especially informed by psychedelics. So often, you know, to access this realm, altered states of consciousness are, are a necessity. That's why Merci Léad called uh, shamanism the archaic techniques of ecstasy. And most often that involves using psychedelic plants or fungi. Shamanism is at least as old as religion, probably predates religion. And in many ways it's similar to religion, but even more. You have to look to shamanism to discover the roots of religion, but also of medicine and pharmacology, chemistry, theater, and even art and poetry. This is all part of the shamanic repertoire. And then we had the Abrahamic religions, the more patriarchal type religions that came into this area. Um, let me see, did I skip one? No. Okay, came into this area and destroyed the mystery uh, religions in the Mediterranean. The Goths invaded and sacked the temple of Demeter in 396 AD. Effectively, this was the end of that era, these uh, psychedelic Bronze Age mystery religions. In the midst of this, Christianity emerged. Not too long. <laughs> Okay, I warned you. <laughs> not too long, not too long. So Christianity emerged about the same time, and by the time the mystery religions were expunged from the cultural scene, Christianity was the official state religion of the Roman Empire. And in common with these other Abrahamic religions, Christianity had a very different perspective on this spirituality and salvation than these pagan religions. In their view, God was separate from nature, not part of nature. God was very judgmental and paternal and fully external to nature, and nature and man were subordinate to this external God. Salvation and revelation were understood to be external to nature. Nothing in nature that you might encounter would lead to salvation. That came from the world beyond and usually after death. This was the promise that was made. The perception was that humans were not part of nature. Nature is subordinate to humanity. Nature exists for us to use and exploit, but we're separate from it. That was their perspective and in fact, Humanity was instructed to rule nature and to subdue the earth. That was the notion of control. We're at the absolute pinnacle of existence and it's our job to run the show. And we've done a really bad job of it since, uh, as you might tell, and we forgot, you know, that we're not running the show and that's been the problems. So with the rise of these religions, pantheism gave rise to monotheism, the idea of one God who is outside of nature. Animism gave why, rise to the total devaluation of nature. Only man has a spiritual nature. Nothing else does. 
mystical experience gave way to doctrines and dogma. Only the priests get to talk to God. Direct experience of the divine by the rest of us schmucks is forbidden. That's heretical. We can't have these direct <laughs> mystical experiences. We need somebody to interpret this for us, tell it what it means. And biophilia, I dare say, gave rise to something unfortunately like necrophilia. Uh, Christ Christianity is focused on uh, a preoccupation with suffering, sin, and death. Um, so in that context, it's not a very happy religion. Um, our preoccupation with death is distorted by Judeo-Christianity. We are understood to be inherently flawed beings, born into sin and Christ died for our sins. Our salvation is found in heaven, not in this world. We must reject this world as inherently evil, especially anything to do with uh, kind of simple basic uh, fundamentals of human nature, such as sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Those are the things that are really bad, right? But if you think about it, those are also what's fundamental to life. Our job in this world is to suffer and to die and to achieve salvation in the next world, which we're promised does exist, but it's kind of a, it's not clear. So 2,000 years on, we're witnessing the effects of this, where we have taken this very sort of, uh, you know, preoccupation with death and suffering, and we've, moved, we've, we've spread it through the whole world. And now the world is dying, and we're killing it. You know, we're raping the earth. We're poisoning it. We're exploiting it. We're criminalizing it, which doesn't make any sense, but that's what we're doing. And basically, we're destroying it. And this is the cultural environmental crisis of our times that, you know, having been sort of seduced by this Judeo-Christian, very anti-life perspective, we're, we're uh, you know, we're doing these things. And it's a hell of a way to treat our mother. Because remember, the earth is our mother. I think the indigenous notion is uh, correct in that way. So we're in this transition. We are in what some people call the Anthropoc Anthropocene. I think I'm saying that right. That's the current geological period where human activities are having a powerful effect on the global environment. As you can see in this picture, we're busily dismantling our environment even as we live here. We're wrecking the place. So we're in the, in the Anthropocene period where these are the determinants of the future of life on Earth what we long for and what we seriously need to, we need to get past that into the so-called psychozoic era, the era of ge geological time which is characterized by the presence of human intelligence. We're not there yet. We're in the geological era characterized by the presence of human stupidity. If you look around, we need to, uh, we need to get past that. So this is, our, this is our task, essentially. If we're going to repair the damage that we've done in the Anthropocene era and get into the Psychozoic era, we have a couple of major tasks waiting for us. Pretty fundamental, number one, wake up. Step one, wake up. Realize what's happening. Step two, wise up. Become wise. Bring these, this wisdom into the forefront and essentially thoughtfulness and thinking about our actions and what is the wise thing to do as we craft this new relationship to nature, which we must do, and we have to do it quickly or you know, it will all be lost. So you know, here we are at this anomalous point in human history. Uh, as, a, as a culture, uh, as a species, we have this perception that we are approaching the end of history. We have a preoccupation uh, with the apocalypse, with the events that will end history. Uh, you know, and, and in, our own, um, in our own selves, we have a preoccupation with death. I think we're the only species that anticipates our death and the only species that thinks about this. I don't think animals spend a lot of time anticipating their death. So we're in a cultural crisis. 
the plant teachers are still with us, fortunately, and they are more and more with us, as, as I think as the situation gets more and more desperate. They're moving out. They've moved from indigenous cultures where they've been sort of, you know, the stewards of indig uh, under stewardship by indigenous cultures for a long, long time. But now they're getting anxious. And so we see things like the globalization of ayahuasca, the emergence of ayahuasca into the global uh, sphere of human affairs. Ayahuasca is no longer an Amazonian plant. It's a global plant. It's escaped from the Amazon as an ambassador of the biosphere, if you will, an ambassador of Gaia, trying desperately to get the message out. And, you know, we're in the bubble. Most of us are probably members of this, you know, or at least have some relationship to the, to the changes that psychedelics are bringing about. But it has to accelerate. It has to, it has to spread. And the knowledge has to spread. These are teachers, and we have to help spread that knowledge. Otherwise, well, the consequences are dire. You know, um, climate change scientists tell us that if we don't get our act together, we've got basically a hundred years left, if that much, before conditions on Earth become inhospitable to life. Maybe just human life. Possibly all life. So we have a mission. We've got to get wise and we have to help spread uh, this message. So there is likely a mushroom of one kind or another in our future, and uh, we hope it's the one on the left. Thank you. I can wish you that. Is that good? Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for that, Dennis. It was fascinating. Um, We've got a little bit of time for questions, if you want to ask some, uh, we're going to keep it relatively brief. I'm just going to take my prerogative as a host and <laughs> just kind of jump in there first. And, uh, okay, assuming... How badly did we go over time? Oh, massively, but it's great. It was all worth it. All right. Uh, we just kind of put down on, on the drinking a bit, that's all. <laughs> uh, so assuming as, as, as kind of monkeys do wake up and, and we avert this kind of biggest wave of mass extinction in 65 million years, which at current rates of species extinction is going to be, we're going to be the only surviving species in about 600 years' time. If we actually survive, we'll be gone without anything well, else. We won't survive because we're dependent on the whole web of life that sustains us, so we won't survive. We could go away tomorrow and probably the whole biosphere would heave a big sigh of relief, my God. That was an experiment that went badly <laughs> off track. <laughs> Thank God we can move past that and you know get back to being life. You know, <laughs> assuming the experiment goes well, though, what, what's coming down the pipe? What do you think life and nature and Gaia have uh, in, in, in mind? Assuming like? the experiment goes well, um, assuming the experiment goes well, I think. Well, first of all, we've got a big task. To uh, you know, to to right the system, to restore the homeostasis on every level, you know, biological, biospherically, uh, all the social problems that we face and, and all that stuff, you know, we've got to we've got to get past that, and we can use the the plant teacher knowledge to hopefully do that. I th I think sometimes of these plant teachers, these are like the. Uh, you know, the bioweapons in a certain way, but I don't like the word bio, I don't like the word weapon, call them the tools, biological tools to help us wake up. And part of our mission, especially if we are involved in the psychedelic world, is to share that knowledge and grow those plants and trade them across the back fence with your neighbors and teach them how to do it and encourage them to teach their neighbors and it all moves very quietly. But it's very effective. It's, it's effective because it is quiet. And if you look at the way ayahuasca has sort of come, become so widespread in this knowledge, it happens. And there's no way they, whoever they are, can stop this because this is an evolutionary process. This is not a legal or societal process. This is evolution trying to develop in an intelligent way, because it is intelligent, a solution to this mess that we've created. 
So if we get all that figured out and we're now, you know, we have green technology, we're not using fossil fuels, that's a big one. We've learned how to uh, um, really heal ourselves. You know, we've, we've repurposed medicine to the, to the function of healing, which it's lost now. Uh, we've discovered a new respect and for ourselves and each other and the way we treat each other. Then I think, uh, so that's great. I mean, that may be all there is to it. And then we just go on for the next billion years or so and it's all happy. But, but sooner or later, we know that uh, the Earth is going to die, whether we do anything about it or not. That has to do with stellar evolution and all those things. But that might buy us a few million years. But sooner or later, the sun is going to turn into a red giant and the Earth is going to be incinerated. So I think part of our task and part of what the uh, psychedelics are doing is they're preparing us to be the catalytic uh, force that moves all life, not just human life, but all life on, off the planet, out into the cosmos. That is really our destiny. And it's interesting that in psychedelic you often have this feeling. We were talking about how DMT, for example, seems like pure science fiction so much. Why do you see all these machines and all these cosmic spaces and all that? It's showing us the future is what it is. That's my latest theory. It's actually showing us where we need to go. And it does not, you know, and uh, this is what life does. You know, it spreads, it grows. This is the whole program for life. It likes to grow and it likes to move things. It likes to conquer new niches or maybe conquer again. There's that patriarchal, you know, aggressive word. But how about explore or, you know, uh, initiate, uh, spread life into new niches. Why should this be confined to the earth? You know, there's a whole cosmos out there. Uh, and life, it's a lot of real estate. There's plenty to be explored. Life wants to explore that. We are life's best hope of making that happen. That's what I meant. We're the problematic primate. We're, you know, life, uh, nature kind of put all its eggs into us and it created this enormously dangerous uh, species. And it's saying, you know, if we can just keep them from destroying things, they can get us there. This is the tool that will get life as a, as a community out of this gravity well that we're trapped in and spread on into the cosmos and will become, you know, the galaxy spanning uh, species that, that we're destined to be, uh, that indeed all life is destined to be. So that, that is the, you know, that's, that's the good outcome. That's what I visualize. That's what I hope will happen someday. We won't live to see it, but it will happen. That's my thought. Uh, then it sounded very much for a wonderful talk, definitely getting the message of why waking up and wising up. Um, just wanted to delve back into where it all went wrong, uh, you know, through your exploration of this patriarchal kind of modality which turned into necrophilia. I think <laughs> why, why did it go wrong? Why after so long of this relationship with plant teachers and clearly mushrooms being available or you know, Syrian room? I, I, remember someone writing in Food of the Gods about how it might have been alcohol that caused that rupture, but I wonder if you agree with that or if you have another perspective or why that? Why did it happen? Well, yeah, we don't really know. I mean, that, that is an interesting idea because alcohol, you know, which is one of the most ancient drugs, but we know it has all of these properties that make it problematic, you know, and violence and, you know, it just many kinds of, you know, it's a poison, um, but it leads to these types of aggressive behavior. So that's, that may have been one factor. Um, there is a fellow named uh, Tony Wright. Uh, I don't know if you are aware of his book. Uh, it's, it used to be, originally it was published called, uh, it was called Left in the Dark, and uh, now it's republished called Return to the Brain of Eden. And he has an interesting idea about the shifts in diet 
that might have brought this about as we moved from an arboreal environment, mainly fruit eaters, and the chemistry of fruit, if we eat on fruit, the, the, uh, the, it contains mild monoamine oxidase inhibitors and amines, and it essentially emulates pineal chemistry. And as, we, as our diet changed through uh, maternal inheritance, we began to eat a lot more meat, a lot more grains, a lot more things that contain steroids, essentially uh, male hormone type things. And over the course of evolutionary time, this may have actually shifted us toward aggression, an aggressive type of behavior. It's kind of a wild theory, but it's also kind of an interesting theory. Free to speculate, because it's not clear how you test it, but that's one possibility. Why it happened, I don't know. I mean, I mean knowledge was lost. Uh, you know, as, as cultures come together, we see it today in this world you know, when a, when a more, um, when an outside culture that's more powerful in all ways encounters an indigenous culture, the first thing to go is knowledge of the plants and the religion that goes around that. And, and look at, uh, you know, the, the career of Christianity in the New World. And these guys were not stupid. They realized that if they're going to put Christianity on on these indigenous cultures, they have to get rid of the shamans, they have to get rid of all these psychedelics because, you know, they can't, they're not receptive to the message. I mean, when, when, they, uh, when the conquistadors got to Central America in around 1525 in that area, the early 1500s, they found these cultures using mushrooms and they had this ecstatic use of mushrooms and they called mushrooms Teonanacatl, which was Aztec for flesh of the gods. And that just infuriated these people because the parallels with the Christian Eucharist were just too, uh, too blatant to be ignored. And so they, they particularly uh, were in particularly enthusiastic in suppressing them because it was, if ever there was blasphemy, this was it in their minds, you know. And of course, the, their sacrament the, the sacrament of communion didn't do a whole lot, you know, but the sacrament of the Aztecs, Teonanacatl, that packed a punch. And uh, they just couldn't deal, they just couldn't put up with that. So these, these psychedelic cultures in the New World were brutally suppressed and the plant knowledge was lost, except it really wasn't, you know. As the work of Wasson showed later, it just went deep, deep underground for 400 years. And then it was rediscovered in the modern era uh, by Wasson's work and others. And, and <laughs> interestingly enough, you know, uh, one of the cultural uh, catalytic uh, triggers that, that began this revival, I think, was the publication in 1957 in Life magazine about Wasson's work in Mexico. And, you know, you wouldn't think an article in a popular magazine would do it, but that magazine was on the, on the coffee table of every family in America. And this was 1957. It certainly is what got Terence and me aware of this in a, certain, in a certain way. I mean, I can remember my brother, you know, carrying this, following my mother around the house, waving this magazine, saying, Mom, Mom, what does this mean? <laughs> you know? She said, well, I don't know, dear, you know? <laughs> and I was too young. I, I couldn't read then, but he was excited about it. And I think a lot of people saw that and they said, hmm, there are, f I think one of the, one of the headlines in, in the, uh, no, in the uh, article was, fungi that cause strange visions. <laughs> And, you know, it was not put forth in a pejorative way or a critical way. It was put forth in a, in a gee whiz way. This, this adventurer went down to Mexico and found these mushrooms that caused strange visions. And that was like, that was cool. So that, in a positive way, brought mushrooms into mass culture. I think that was a big trigger, actually. That and some other things. And then, of course, you know, LSD and Timothy Leary and all that came along, our culture was, uh, you know, hungry for something, hungry for genuine spiritual experience. And people were finding that their religion, religion wasn't really uh, delivering this. And so when these, these, these catalytic substances came into the culture, there was great fascination about them. 
Now, we didn't know what to do with them. We, didn't, we were not at the time aware of the indigenous traditions. We didn't really know how to handle LSD in the culture. It was, so it was considered really threatening and disruptive. And in fact, it was. But now we've had 40 years or more to learn about these psychedelics and how to use them to borrow the knowledge or adopt the knowledge of indigenous cultures. And so we're using them now in a much more uh, intelligent way, if you will, a much more, uh, you know, less recreational and more, uh, you know, spiritual or, or uh, reflective way. And that's good. That's a good sign. It's a sign that, you know, as monkeys, we can wake up and we can learn things. So I'm encouraged by that. Dennis, for, for me, there seems to be a leap in your argument from um, plant production of, for example, bitter compounds, um, which are basically saying, don't eat with me, I'll screw with your guts, or plants that will burn your mucous membranes, and such like, uh, where you can impute a kind of intentionality on the part of the plant to protect itself to suggesting that psychoactive compounds are, are there to say, um, please play nice with nature. Um, Symbiosis. Because, for example, um, bitter compounds may be useful to rid the body of parasites, and plants argue do not produce saponins to mm -hmm. wash our clothes. Mm -hmm. Some other purpose one presumes. So how would you argue in more detail that it's not a happy accident? that um, the psychoactive substances are produced by plants, um, even if they are, uh, thankfully, making people have a, a more appreciative attitude towards nature? Well, uh, that it's not an accident. Um, I mean, maybe, maybe something I, I didn't make clear before, and, and it is kind of important to this, is that these messenger molecules that plants make you know, they have multiple purposes, right? So the same compounds at one level, maybe in, on the level that they interact with, say, bacteria or fungi, is one thing. And the way they interact with us, the same compounds, may be something different. You know, maybe psychoactive or whatever. Whether it's an accident or not, I mean, in some ways, I guess it is an accident, you know, because popularly in evolution, we don't think about teleology, we don't attribute a purpose to nature or, uh, you know, that it's actually going somewhere, uh, you know, that it has, but then you look around and you say, well, maybe that model doesn't really apply. Maybe we've been overlooking some things because if you look at nature at every level, it appears to be organized in a way that that makes sense, you know, and, and that's partly what I think is meant by the intelligence of nature. You know, we're not attributing a designer. There's no intelligent designer. Nature's the designer, and it organizes itself in a way that makes sense. And that's why so many of the solutions we find in biology are so elegant, because they, they, take, uh, they take account of this. And if the ultimate goal or you know what life likes to do is spread it's it's organized itself in such a way that it can optimize this spread through sort of inventing us the problematic monkey now um, its challenge is to you know groom us properly to teach us how to how to be wise and then we'll be okay can i say it's not an accident well no not really. I mean, maybe it's an accident. Um, luck, what's an accident? <laughs> you know, lucky for us, it happened. Whether it's an accident, I don't know. I, I do think that, you know, knowing what we know about the way matter's organized and, and the way things happen, you know, you do get these emergent quality, qualities that come out of complex systems. Inevitably, so I think intelligence and co neural complexity is shown in the brain. Is this something that emerges out of evolution, uh, complex systems? Probably happens many, many times on many planets. So maybe that will be the next challenge, you know, as we do move beyond our, uh, you know, immediate 
solar system and so on, what we're going to find is, I, I believe, I would like to believe, that life is quite common in the universe, that the universe is really permeated with life. It's the rule, not the exception. Others would argue with that, and it's, there's no way to know, so we can argue about it endlessly and have fun doing that. <laughs> Until you actually go there, you can't say, but uh, what we know about uh, prebiotic evolution and the probable way that life uh, arose on this planet, this is, these are simple processes. And so you'd see this repeated over and over again in lots of planetary ecosystems as planets evolve and the astronomers are telling us now that planets are not rare, they're the, uh, they're the rule that many, many, many planets out there. Some have got to be like Earth. They're in the so-called right zone, the, you know, what the astronomers call the Goldilocks zone, not too hot, not too cold, <laughs> you know. So I don't know. Um, maybe it was an accident. Well, thank you. I do accept that we probably have long and very complex relationships with scientific plants. I do accept that, but it just seems to me there's difficulties around the issue of kind of intentionality. Mm -hmm. is, um, yeah. yeah, there are difficulties around it. But read uh, read Michael Pollan's article called "The Intelligent Plant." <coughs> it doesn't directly. It does not directly address these questions, but what it does do is show that <coughs> you know that plants do have behavior, and that it looks a lot like intelligent behavior. They're remarkably clever about lots of things, so why not us? Uh, I think what we'll do. <coughs> Sorry. We'll draw it to a close. There, we can continue the conversation for another half hour or so. With that kind of oldest of um, substances, and probably led to already see alcohol. Uh, the bar's open. Uh, <laughs> Dennis doesn't have any books here. We do have some other books available, but uh, Dennis' latest book, Brothers of the Spirit, a bit about uh, his uh, life with uh, his brother Terence. And just join me in thanking Dennis for a wonderful show. Thank you. Thank what? Get you a glass of wine. That would be good. Yeah, thanks. I, I forgot. I totally forgot to plug my book. So thanks to David for mentioning it. The, the Brotherhood of the Screaming Abyss. The, that's what brought me over here. I sold all my books at the conference, so I can't bring any here. But it's on Amazon and stuff. So please buy it. I have a bunch of them. Got to get rid of it.